I know some folks are still uh, filing in. I'm glad to see we have such a, uh, a good turnout today on this uh, somewhat rainy day. Um, uh, my name is Brian Jacob. I'm a faculty member at the Ford School and director of the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. This is one of our kind of, uh, regular public lectures on uh, education policy topics. Today, uh, we are delighted to have Mike McPherson, the president of the Spencer Foundation, here to speak with us about um, the undermatch phenomenon in college choice. And he will tell you lots about what that is and uh, why we should care about it. Um, uh, I have known uh, Mike since I was a graduate student and reading some of his uh, early work in the economics of education. Um, but when he was coming here and I knew I would have to introduce him, I had the opportunity to have looked back more of his bio. Um, and it really is remarkable how much he has done over the course of his career from being kind of a faculty member at Williams um, uh, and then going on to uh, the presidency of McAllister College and now serving as the president of the Spencer Foundation. Um, and what actually I think amazes me even kind of more than his earlier academic achievements is the fact that now as the president of the Spencer Foundation, he still finds the time to do serious academic research and not just publish articles, but publish entire books. Um, and the, his, one of his latest books is uh, Crossing the Finish Line, Completing College at America's Public Universities. Um, and I think he'll be drawing on some of that material uh, today. And so he is a, you know, someone with a, a really unique uh, perspective, both you know, as an academic, but someone who interacts with lots of researchers and lots of policymakers and practitioners uh, through his uh, the work of the Spencer Foundation. So uh, I'm delighted that he is here uh, to join us. Um, so I'm gonna, in one minute, I will turn it over uh, to Mike to get started. But I would like to thank um, the Ford School for, uh, for hosting. I'd like to recognize support provided by Charles and Susan Gessner. Um, and I'd like to thank Bonnie Roberts and uh, Tom Cook and some of the other folks who have uh, put together the logistics for this event. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over uh, to Mike to tell us about the College Undermount. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, uh, it's always a real pleasure to, to uh, visit Ann Arbor and see so many friends and so many interesting people at uh, the University of Michigan. Before I get started, I did want to say I know some of you may be thinking that you'd like to slip out a little early because there's a big calculus exam uh, tomorrow. Uh, so just so you know, in the last five minutes, I'm going to give you the answers to two of the problems in tomorrow's <laughs> calculus exam. So you may want to stick around for that. Uh, so I want to talk today about a a phenomenon that became a big focus of our attention when we were writing Crossing the Finish Line, uh, and we came to call it Undermatch. Uh, and I'll explain more about what that is. It's not something that we were by any means the first to discover, but it actually was not a phenomenon that we had anticipated, and it's always exciting when you're doing empirical work uh, to find something interesting and unexpected <coughs> along the way. Uh, a lot of work was done in this area earlier, very influential work by folks at the University of Chicago, particularly in the Consortium for Chicago School Research. Uh, I'll explain to you what this is all about. Uh, um, let me first describe, my, let, me, let me say what my plan is for this talk. Uh, I want to review some of the basics about the book, why we wrote the book, what the evidence is that we came up with and how we interpreted it. I'll comment on a couple of the questions that can be raised about that, that evidence. Some of you may want to help with that, uh, by either by answering my questions or more likely by raising more. Uh, and then I want to explore what uh, policy implications at different levels might be thought to follow from this analysis. And I hope we can make that part of the the afternoon more open-ended. Uh, I think actually th these are very complex things to think through at the policy level and I would not claim at all that in writing the book where we were mainly trying to describe our findings that we had those thought through and I wouldn't claim that I have them thought through now. But 
I think they're really interesting and they're, they're a nice case of, of empirical evidence interacting with uh, empirical kind of economic evidence interacting with broader policy thinking. Uh, and perhaps there are other studies that may be suggested, other work that might be suggested as one tries to think the implications <coughs> through. Anyhow, uh, the way we got into this book was uh, uh, my wonderful mentor, Bill Bowen, who had been uh, the president of, the, the Princeton, of Princeton University and then of the Mellon Foundation, uh, and then had uh, pretended to retire, uh, uh, got interested in the phenomenon of uh, graduation from public universities in the United States. This was a, a change of focus for Bill, who had done tons of important work on the private university and college world, and Mellon had given a lot of its attention to that world. Uh, but in the larger scheme of things, uh, we know that public higher education educates the bulk of the students, and the issues facing public higher education are ones that are going to be very important for the future of the country. So uh, Bill recruited me to work with him and also recruited uh, a young man named uh, Matt Chingos, who was uh, a graduate student at Harvard University, uh, actually had just completed his undergraduate career when he started this, uh, and was going to begin graduate study in political science at Harvard University uh, after that. Matt is an extraordinarily talented data analyst, uh, the, the fastest gun in the East, I think, when it comes to generating results, and uh, also a really good analytical thinker. So uh, we formed a team of, of three people and uh, dug into the data. Now, the data was really uh, put together through Bill Bowen's remarkable ability to get people to do what he wants them to do. Uh, he is really an amazing man. And uh, what we did was approach uh, flagship public universities, the leading public universities, in a number of states uh, to seek all the data they had on students who entered for undergraduate study uh, in the fall of 1999. We did this in 2006, and we looked for uh, the, everything they had by way of their background data, their admissions file, and so on, what kind of data was in that, and their transcript data thereafter. So for these students, we had uh, a very extensive data set about them. And we succeeded, ultimately, Bill succeeded in getting, uh, I think it's something like 22 of these universities to cough up their data. Uh, in the age of FERPA, this was a truly remarkable achievement on, on Bill's part. Uh, and those data were then merged with uh, College Board SAT background data, SAT people give an interview about students' backgrounds when, when you take the exam, similar data from ACT, and linked to the National Student Clearinghouse for information on, on the fate of people who left the <coughs> university before they graduated. Uh, that was quite a lot of data, uh, but it wasn't enough for Bill. So uh, 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 he also persuaded uh, the systems, the public university systems in four states to uh, give us the data on, on their whole uh, public four-year college system. So in addition to those flagships, we wound up with a sample of what used to be called state colleges, kind of, you know, a step down in the pecking order of higher education uh, for uh, four states. Uh, and in the case of North Carolina, we actually got the data on their HBCUs and on their community colleges. The, those are the only community colleges, community college results that we had uh, in, the, in the system. Again, same kind of data, individual level data for the students entering in the fall of, of 1999. So 
that was a tremendous asset, of course, because it gave us a little better handle on some of what was going on with selection uh, across these different, different systems. Uh, we, we were interested in the study in trying to figure out the sources of variation in graduation rates. We took as our objective to try to explain as well as we could with these data college completion. We didn't pay uh, principal attention to grade point average in college or uh, and we didn't have data on these students after they graduated so we weren't looking at later life outcomes. This was really looking at uh, people beginning following their careers and seeing if they dropped out or if they completed within six years. Uh, we were interested in, in race and gender effects, in effects of, of that we could infer. Uh, now, of course, I'm using effects here even though these are observational data and we need to be careful about causation. But as control variables in our various analyses, we had race and gender and high school test scores and high school grades and family background and family income and lots of things like that. And we proceeded to uh, analyze those data. Uh, motivation for the study uh, is easy enough to, to describe. Uh, this, this figure shows uh, uh, educational attainment by age 35 for people who were born uh, in various years over a long period of time. I think this is from uh, uh, Golden and Katz, but it's certainly data of the kind that they made familiar, which you see this steady march of improved educational attainment uh, that coincides with uh, the enormous progress of the United States economy over much of that period, and which Golden and Katz and others have argued uh, there's evidence that those things are causally related. The U.S. led the world in expanding educational opportunity for most of that period. Uh, and then uh, a fairly abrupt tailing off of progress in overall educational attainment uh, for people who were born, it's a little hard to see from this angle, but people who were born in uh, something like 1950. Uh, and various possible explanations could be offered for that, that uh, uh, slowdown, dr drastic slowdown in progress in educational attainment. Uh, you know, maybe everybody who could be educated already was educated. You could go through a lot of, a lot of possibilities. Uh, but in fact, we know that over that same period, uh, other countries caught up with and surpassed the United States in these figures. So it's a little hard <coughs> on that basis to think that, that we had encountered some natural limit. In any case, there's been a lot of emphasis in the United States on wanting to improve educational attainment for reasons both of equity and of economic success. And uh, this is a, an illustration of what motivated that kind of concern. Uh, another kind of concern, and also shedding light on where the opportunities might lie if you want to improve college success, uh, is to look at a bachelor's degree attainment by socioeconomic status. These are data from NELS, not from our uh, uh, study. And uh, two things come through dramatically in, in this simple graphic. One is that if you're a first generation college student, and we define that in terms of whether one of your parents graduated from college, overall you have a substantially lower likelihood of graduating from college than if at least one parent graduated. And then within those two categories, uh, your family income background makes a lot of difference. So if you're a first generation bottom quartile of income, uh, less than one in 10 from that group get a bachelor's degree. If you're a, a if you're a child of college-educated parents in the top income quartile, seven times as large a percentage get a bachelor's degree. Now, most standards of equity or fairness would say there's something very disturbing about these relationships. 
But also, if what you're thinking about is where are you going to get more college graduates from, it seems obvious that the place to look is the lower bars. You know, you could squeeze out more college graduates from those, that group that's already getting 68 percent, but that kind of looks like an uphill battle at that point, and in that, in that region, maybe that's about the number you're going you're gonna to reach. Uh, but if you could find a way to change the results for people who currently have very low probabilities of graduation, obviously you could do, you could do a lot more. And we wanted to find out what might seem feasible in that regard. Now, as we did this work, we looked at, at a number of different factors that seem to be at play. And this is, as any of you who have, who have read it or carried it around know, this is a big book, even though the appendices were put up on the web. Uh, so I'm not going to try to summarize the findings of the book. Uh, but one thing started to uh, leap out at us as we continued to do the work. Uh, and this was what we came to call the undermatch phenomenon. And this, this, this graphic highlights one of the, the major findings from, from our evidence in the book. We, had, uh, uh, we developed a way to define what we meant by uh, an undermatched student. And the idea here was that we could infer quite a bit about what kind of credentials it took to have a high probability of admission to, say, a flagship state university. And so we could simulate for students in our study uh, the probability that we could identify students who had a very good probability of getting into one of these more demanding selective places if they apply. And we could look at what happened for those students who had those qualifications and did that, and what happened to students who had those qualifications and didn't do that. So here we focus on, over here on the left, the students who went to a less selective institution, in particular a category B in our selectivity scheme, uh, even though their credentials indicated that they very likely could have gone to a more selective institution. And we looked at graduation rates for students who had similar credentials. This is very important. Th these are students who had similar high school grades and similar test scores. In general, you, you expect to find highly selective institutions have higher graduation rates because they're picking out students who are already more likely to graduate. But in terms of what we could observe, we controlled for that. And then we, we did the comparison. For four-year graduation rates, which is the darker bar, students who undermatched had less than a 50 percent chance of completing the degree. Students who went ahead to their match school, that is, who were capable of getting into a selective A and did go to a selective A, had about a 60 percent chance of successfully completing. And if you took six years, you added a about 22 points to each of those, so the difference in those outcomes was maintained. Uh, that's a significant difference for, uh, for sure in the data set of the size that, that we had. Uh, and it's a little bit counterintuitive. You know, I must say that we've talked about this stuff so much that now it seems not surprising at all. But if you said to yourself, look, I don't actually care how, how good the food is, how good the education is, anything about what, what my life is going to be like. What I care about is, am I going to graduate? Should I go to the hardest place I can get into or the easiest place I can get into? Well, turns out you should go to the hardest place you can get into. Uh, it doesn't actually work out that uh, Playing an easier opponent in tennis terms, in this case, actually leads to a better result. Now, there's, we could have a lot of speculation about, about why that seems to be true. And of course, I'm stating it more dramatically than the evidence really supplies. But this, this suggests that a strategy of looking for an easy way to pick up a, a BA uh, 
doesn't turn out to be a highly effective strategy, quite the opposite. Uh, now that in itself is an interesting phenomenon and it suggests that if you're interested in college completion, you should encourage people to challenge themselves by going to the more selective place if they can get in. And I should say, in most of the cases of undermatch, these are not students who applied. They're not students for sure who applied and were turned down. They're also not students who applied, were accepted, and didn't go. Most of these are students who never applied to a more selective place. Right? And that's a, they never tested those waters. Now, another very important fact that we discovered how likely were students from different uh, income groups to undermatch? And this shows the, the percentage of students who undermatched uh, uh, based on their family income on the left and on their parents' education on the right. Uh, and there is clearly a pretty dramatic relationship to family income in the extent of undermatching. Uh, so, uh, more than half of students from the bottom quartile uh, in, in income, even if they have, uh, more, more than half of students from the bottom quartile uh, undermatch, and only about a quarter from the top quartile uh, undermatch. And something analogous is going on with, with the level of parental education. Uh, so, this suggests that uh, in addition to the general concern that people uh, may be making choices that don't maximize their opportunity, is a concern that those choices are concentrated among uh, the less affluent students. So this seemed to us, as it did to our colleagues in Chicago, Melissa Roderick and colleagues at the University of Chicago, a very important thing to focus on, and Melissa and company have done a series of studies related to this, to this phenomenon for students coming out of the Chicago Public Schools, which is really very interesting, and they were, they were an important stimulus to our, and advisor to our work. Uh, I want to emphasize uh, one point that I think is sometimes missed here. Uh, we often find this phenomenon talked about in terms of students failing to go to highly selective institutions. So if you think there is a, for example, a, uh, a group of what I call the snooties, which are sort of the 30 or so most selective uh, universities and liberal arts colleges in the United States, they prefer to call themselves COFI, the Consortium on Financing Higher Education. And if they had let McAllister in, I might have also <laughs> adopted that name. Uh, and you think about, well, you know, and people at Williams wring their hands about how can we recruit more of these students who could actually succeed if they came here. But we found in our data set that this was a very widespread phenomenon at different levels of selectivity. And uh, when uh, David Leonhardt from the New York Times was working on uh, the piece that <laughs> wonderfully came out on the front page of the business section of the New York Times on the day the book came out, uh, Anybody who wants to get attention to a book, give it to Leonhardt two months in advance. Uh, 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 we found, as you could see here consistently, as uh, you look at students with different levels of qualification and graduation rates, that if you have a high, a high level of qualifications and you go to a very low selectivity place, you pay a substantial price in terms of of likelihood of college completion. If you, and if you have a low level of qualifications, you also pay a substantial price in terms of, of college completion. So uh, we're not simply talking here about moving people from Roxbury Community College to Harvard University. We're talking about moving people from Chicago State to uh, UIC from UIC to Urbana-Champaign, from Urbana-Champaign to Northwestern, those moves seem, there seems to be consistency in this phenomenon of undermatch. Uh, 
we were focused mainly on less selective and more selective four-year colleges. But in North Carolina, we had data on people who entered community colleges as well. And looking at the same outcome, a bachelor's degree in six years, we, we examined the likelihood that you would achieve a bachelor's degree in six years if you started at a community college. Now, uh, community colleges have a lot of different categories of students included in their population. And uh, uh, this was a culled group of students that we looked at. These were all students who had taken the SAT, who were attending full time, and who indicated that their aim was to get a bachelor's degree. So uh, a lot of the heterogeneity that you normally encounter in trying to figure out community college data was accounted for. And we used a propensity score matching to uh, identify students whose characteristics were those that most typically would have started at a community college in our data, which, which were the ones over here, uh, which meant low test scores, low family income, uh, low, low high school grades, and people who were quite unlikely to start at a community college based on the typical background of community college students. And we found a really big difference in the probability of getting a bachelor's degree within six years if you started by going full-time at a community college. Uh, and data like this have been analyzed in, in several other states, and similar kinds of results have been found. And there's also some work that's more difficult to do with national data that, that suggests something similar. Uh, community college people really, really hate <laughs> this, <laughs> this graph and this message. Uh, and the conversation I've had with folks is often that's not true here. That that may be true in North Carolina, but that's not true here. And uh, they, they believe that. And uh, what I do is ask them to send us the data. Uh, and nobody has, you know, and I don't think this is willful on their part. They, they are influenced greatly by the the stories of the people who succeeded, I think. Uh, and they're influenced greatly by the fact that, that this population we're looking at is a relatively unusual one in community colleges. And many, many people have very good reasons why they don't finish in six years. So, so, and we don't think this is trashing community colleges. I think that's a very important point. Uh, uh, one thing that's really important is that in our data, if you entered a four-year institution after completing an associate's degree at a community college, your chances of success were very similar to people who had started by entering at a four-year institution. The issue wasn't that people came out of community colleges with associate's degrees and were ill-educated and couldn't cut it uh, in, in the data that we were able to look at. The issue was they didn't come out with an associate's degree. It was attrition within that population. And I think the, the people who are doing this every day are overly influenced by the success stories and, and excuse the people who disappeared. Uh, that, that would be my story. And of course, it's quite possible that you know, some states do things rather differently. And it's quite possible that some of them really have much greater success. And it would be great to document that, because that would be a real opportunity to learn. But as far as we could see, this is a phenomenon of a similar kind to uh, uh, the undermatch within the, the four-year, the population of four-year institutions. Uh, so that's it for basically the summary of the evidence that we developed uh, in our book. Uh, other work has been done since then. I know uh, Jeff Smith here has been doing work on mismatch and so on. Uh, I don't, we haven't done any other work on this. After writing a, a book like this with Bill Bowen and having a full-time job, I'm still in rehab. So uh, 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 we haven't tackled the next, the next chapter. And there are lots and lots of good questions that, uh, 
no doubt partly owing to the limits of our own skills and imagination and partly owing to the limits of the kind of data we have, these, there were a lot of questions that certainly could benefit from much further research. And we'll talk about some of those as we go along. Uh, but I want to uh, think about what may be going on in producing this phenomenon. And uh, a lot of this is speculative. I mean, it's all speculative in terms of the evidence that we have within the confines of our book. But, uh, you know, we certainly read a lot of stuff at, at the time we were doing the book. We talked to people at several of the campuses where we were uh, working. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've looked at other people's evidence from interviewing students. And, and uh, there's also evidence that we now have because of uh, uh, an outfit because of an effort in the city of Chicago to try a, a random control study to affect the outcome here by giving uh, intense college counseling to students who seem to have the promise based on their junior year records of, of getting to a more selective place. And so through that avenue, in the pilot study of that, we've learned more about how students are experiencing this, this college selection process. So if you think about what leads people to undermatch, one obvious question people may ask themselves is, can I really afford to go to Northwestern uh, if I'm uh, a poor kid in Chicago? Uh, can I really afford to go to DePaul? Which is a very different question, as I'll say in a second, from Northwestern. Uh, and to some extent, for many schools, the answer is, no, you really can't afford it. You know, there is a real problem about, about price and adequate aid and how much borrowing you're really wise to do to go to the more selective place. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm pretty persuaded that a lot of people are poorly informed about what it would really cost to go to uh, uh, a subset of the more selective places that actually have quite a bit of money. And I want to emphasize a subset. I was talking to somebody this afternoon in my office who recently visited Albion College in, in, in uh, Michigan, and they don't have the money to finance a lot of low-income students. But, you know, McAllister certainly would finance any student who, who was admitted, and many, many of the more, most selective schools are in that situation. But I think a lot of people don't know it, and the system is terribly complex. Uh, I think another non-trivial factor is parents are scared of putting a choice like this in front of their kids because they're afraid they won't be able to, to uh, finance it. And they don't want uh, their daughter to fall in love with a place and then tell her we can't pay for it. And I think they, therefore, are inclined not to enter the game in the first place, not to apply. And well, let's find out, right? Let's see if we can afford it. But if you find out, then, then as a parent, you're in a box. Like, how much am I going to stretch to make this happen? I think that's one of the things that goes on. Uh, does it really matter where I go? Uh, I think one of the reasons you see relatively low levels of undermatch among uh, college graduate families and affluent families is they're well informed about labor markets for highly, more highly educated workers. And they know it matters. They certainly know it matters if you're going to go on to law school, medical school, business school, et cetera. And uh, it matters in a lot of other careers as well, and it matters in networking, it matters in a lot of different ways uh, where you get your degree, let alone the fact that you're more likely to get it. Uh, but for families with a first kid going to college for the first time, going to college is the achievement. And the idea that going to college is just a stepping stone to the real achievement. Uh, uh, will I fit in? Uh, this is a question for the parents as well as for 
uh, the student. Uh, these, we, we don't understand at a place like the University of Michigan and certainly at places like Williams and McAllister what a foreign country a selective college is to a lot of first generation college students. Uh, it's, I always notice, I, I'm challenged in terms of my sense of direction personally, uh, that I get lost a lot on college campuses. And college campuses remind me of small New England towns <laughs> that everybody knows where the business school building is. And if you don't know, you don't belong here. That's certainly the way I felt the whole time I lived in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Uh, 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 if you need a sign, we don't want you. Uh, and just think the physical map of these campuses is terribly confusing. The conceptual map of a college catalog that's got, I don't know, at, at Michigan probably hundreds of thousands of courses or something. I mean, you know, we assume people know how to navigate that pretty well. And that's wrong. We assume when they land at O'Hare, they're going to know how you get to Northwestern. And that's wrong. You know, there's, we just don't comprehend that. And I feel like as a college president, I was way too dense about that, that for too long. Uh, and, and that's a real problem. There's also the problem, as my friend Morty used to say when he was president of Williams, that, that in some parts of the country there are lots of people who want their son or daughter to have a Williams degree, but they don't want a Williams education. Because a Williams education means challenging a lot of the values that they grew up with. And that's a scary thing. Finally, in my list, and in a second I'm going to invite you to contribute to it, why can't our daughter, our son, just stay home with us? For a lot of families, there are very pragmatic as well as emotional reasons why there's a need to have that son or daughter at home. Uh, for families for, who are not native English speakers, sometimes that, that child is their communication with the Anglo world. And that's important to them. Sometimes the child is an important source of financial support. And that's important to them. And sometimes the child is an important source of child care and other kinds of activities. And, and the list goes on. Plus, it's certainly in many families, the emotional pain of that separation is great. I, re I remember dropping my son off at Wesleyan, getting back in the car and crying for 10 minutes before I could drive because the idea of that separation was so, so strong. But you know, I mean, I'd been in this world, I understood this was the right thing to do, this was going to work out well. If it's not in your background, it's a really different thing. So I think there are lots of reasons uh, why this may be a choice that's, uh, that's not optimal from a an educational and economic point of view and uh, where the right kind of intervention might make a difference. Let me, before I go to the next slide, uh, which is going to raise some other kinds of questions, I would be happy, and I'd like to do this from here out, to just uh, invite uh, your observations about this question of what, what is it that might be producing the undermatch uh, or reactions to the story that I've Told. Let me say that on the next slide, I'm going to talk about the question of whether this is causal. So you're all eager to ask that, but you might hold off on that particular question. But are there observations anybody would care to share about this? Uh, what would make it, and the questions here are really framed toward what makes it particularly likely that people from low income or disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to undermatch? Yes. Well, you talked about intensive college counseling programs, and I think one of the big things is that students maybe don't even know these colleges exist. If you're talking about students in public school in Harlem, they've never heard of Williams College. They don't know anyone who's been there. So how are they going to know to apply unless somebody directs them that way? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that's a valid observation. I think in general, uh, college counselors 
are really guidance counselors who do college counseling part-time. They're very stretched. There's about one for every 500 students in American high schools. Uh, and they're not very knowledgeable. Uh, and they have a lot of other responsibilities. And uh, they certainly don't have the kind of time or, or background to sit down and work in depth with an individual student about these kinds of questions. Uh, and I, I want to emphasize it's not their fault. I mean, they're asked to do an impossible job. Yes? <clears throat> you kind of mentioned it at the micro level about not wanting to leave the family, but is there maybe also some play of feeling that they're leaving behind their community and kind of the roots, and yeah. if they go to this new world, what does that say about how they yeah, connect sure with the community? I'm sure that's right. I think uh, in Chicago, I think Melissa and company found that, that uh, uh, one of the attractions of the local community college is that's where their friends are going, and so they can they can uh, stay together. That's you know way back in 1968, Sandy Jenks and David Reisman wrote a book called *The Academic Revolution*, and one of the things they emphasized was that a lot more people were going away from home to go to school, uh, and you know that they really. We're seeing the beginning of the national market for higher education. And they actually suggested in that book that maybe colleges should give a year's credit just for living away from home. <laughs> and and uh, forget it, they're not doing it at Michigan. You're not going <laughs> to get that. But, but it's an interesting thought that part of what makes it easy to stay home may also be a thing that, that interrupts the possibility of certain kinds of new experiences that would result in you growing. But you know, may also alienate you from things that you value tremendously. Yes. Yeah. I think there's also sometimes perceptions of a degree of difficulty when you don't have peers or older siblings or someone that's gone to a more elite school that it'll be too hard. Whereas a lot of people who've been to very elite schools will almost say the opposite of, on like a joke level, like the hardest thing about this place is getting into it and the work is not necessarily, you know, exponential degrees more difficult than something slightly yeah. lower. People are afraid they won't succeed in academic. Yeah, yeah I, I, I suspect that that's true. I think also it's true that, that many people would have no way of anticipating this, but that there are a lot of positive aspects to the peer effect of having, being surrounded by students who have acquired you know, a certain amount of diligence uh, at, at least until sometime on Thursday, and then they get it back on, on Monday. Uh, and, and, uh, and also engage with their fellows in, you know, that kind of, of interaction. I mean, peer effects of one kind or another seem likely to be important to the underlying phenomenon that, that you are more likely to graduate if you go to a, a more selective place. Uh, but they may also, you may really misestimate that when you're deciding where to go. Uh, I think there's a growing population of students from citizenship or legal status um, will dampen their aspirations because they can't get public benefits to get financial aid um, or, or just makes it just makes it impossible, especially if work um, prospects seem dim. Yeah, no, I, I think the, the, uh, the whole set of issues that surrounds uh, the opportunities facing the un undocumented people it, you know, in work and in, in school are, are certainly a factor for a large part of these populations. Let me, I'm sure people have more ideas, but let, let me push on and we can come back to any of this. Uh, I've, I've told the story on the basis that our descriptive uh, observational analysis in fact is capturing a, a real causal phenomenon. <coughs> that uh, the people who undermatch really are like the people who matched. And uh, uh, if they uh, made the other choice, they would have results like the people who matched. Uh, but as in almost everything, uh, involving education that people study, you have to worry about selection effects. 
self-selection in this case because we're talking mainly about people who didn't apply, not people who got turned down. Uh, so, you know, one story you can tell, and it certainly doesn't have zero validity, is that you know something about yourself that doesn't appear in your high school transcript or in your, your uh, uh, SAT score. That there's a reason private information to you relative to the researcher that you can predict that you wouldn't have this typical experience if you went to the, to the more selective place. Uh, and therefore, there's a rational element in your judgment not to try it because you're not going to have the experience that those folks had. Uh, that, that's got to be the case to some extent for folks uh, in this group. There are uh, a couple of reasons why I'm pretty strongly inclined to believe that that's not the bulk of this story. Uh, one reason is that big difference in income groups. Uh, if there is a, uh, a set of things that we're missing about people's personal qualities or, you know, something about, you know, something we can't get at, uh, I haven't thought of a good story, maybe you will, about why that should be unequally distributed across income classes, that people in people with lower income are better at predicting the effect on them of going to a place which is like nothing they've ever seen than people with higher incomes who know more about those kinds of places. That, that seems surprising if it's true. Uh, the other thing is the, the effects are pretty big and pretty consistent across a lot of different choice sets. And it doesn't seem like the same quality would turn up everywhere if there is some hidden set of qualities. It's not, that's not a, none of these are knockdown arguments. God knows they're not. Uh, and of course, what you want to do is test this stuff empirically. But uh, uh, that, that seems like uh, uh, a factor. And then I think something that's not really based on quantitative information, if you look at how, at the story of how folks go about making these choices, and particularly, uh, one of the, the papers in the Consortium on Chicago School Research series uh, followed students who went to one of Chicago's seven selective colleges, uh, selective high schools. These are, these are the high schools like Walter Payton um, and uh, six others, where you don't get in unless you have high test scores and high grades and good, good assessments from your teachers, and you have good counseling, and you get the right schools on your radar screen, and you intend to apply. And then, in too many cases, you drift away. I mean, you read this stuff, the only word you say is you drift away. You, oh, God, I missed that. I, you know, I, I just wasn't thinking about it. You know, I'll, I'll be fine. I can just do this, this thing that all my friends are doing, you know, it's not that important, you know, my mom is so excited that I'm going to graduate and as long as I go someplace, everything's going to be fine. Uh, this doesn't sound, I mean, a lot, these, the experience doesn't sound like people who have some grounded reason for thinking that their, their experience is going to be different. Uh, we also know from a variety of, of sources that, including sort of personal testimony, but also quantitative information, that the information lacks are very big. You know, that, that, that wonderful study that uh, 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 Bridget Long and Eric Bettinger did working with H&R Block to see what the effect is, not on college match, but on college application, simply by providing people who came in to get their taxes done with the opportunity to get their, their financial aid form filled out at the same time. And it had really su substantial, significant effects on the probability of college going. So, 
there are just a lot of reasons to think we're in an information poor environment and that that would have a much bigger impact on low income people than on, on people from more affluent communities. But you know, if you really want to be sure, you want, you know, you know the, the, the modern biblical blessing of an RCT. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of such studies underway now. Uh, 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 Caroline Hoxby and uh, Sarah Turner uh, are working on very low cost, very widespread intervention, which just provides targeted, uh, adapted to the individual information in a letter. And, and there are a couple of variations on this. What they're trying to see if they can move students' college choices by doing that. We are tangentially involved, those of us who wrote this book, in MDRC's effort in Chicago to try a very different high cost intensive intervention to move students' choices. Now, if we move their choices, we then have the raw material for a test of whether the results turn out to be like the results you get from the observational data. Do these, these folks who made a different choice, we know on average, assuming that the experiments have a positive significant outcome, we know that, that they did, a significant number of them chose to go to a different place than they would have otherwise because they're, they're matched at random to people who didn't get that treatment. Uh, and we can see if, in fact, they turn out to be more likely to succeed in college. So, you know, uh, I'll be around, I hope, in 2017 or 18. Check, check back, and uh, we'll let you know. There also may be more ingenious things to do with these data than we thought of, or there may be other data. I, again, I know uh, Jeff Smith, and uh, I talked to him and a graduate student who is right over here, uh, Nora, right? Uh, uh, are working on these problems, and what they're doing sounds like really interesting. Uh, so I think I think they're very good good questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead to talk about policy implications on the assumption that there's a real causal effect here. Uh, but before I do that, uh, if anybody wants to raise any questions about this causal analysis, uh, I'd welcome. Them. Yes. Uh, just in kind of separating the mechanisms versus taking the easy way out versus kind of an information thing, um, yeah. did you happen to see if there was any sort of patterns of sort of taking the easier approach in high school, like kids with really high test scores taking fewer AP exams or kind of, you know, maybe not, you know, having less frequency of taking calculus or, you know, anything else that makes it look like a pattern of going easy? The uh, thing is, we were, we were matching people on those characteristics, right? So if... Uh, on course taking or just on... Well, not, sir, not, not down to the level of course taking, but on the level of... Well, you're right. With GPA, you could have gotten the GPA with an uh, a easier load. No, we didn't do that. That's a very interesting thing to think about. Did, did, were there signals in other parts of their, their behavior that would... would be consistent with them being less diligent or something of that kind. I mean, I think actually one of the important, again, not a new finding, but one of the important things we saw in this study is that uh, uh, high school GPA is far better at predicting college completion than test scores are. And uh, again, we don't have, you know, a, any way of testing exactly why that's true, but. I, I think it's the Woody Allen effect. 80% of life is just showing up. And the way you get a good GPA in high school is you just do the work. And that's a very good predictor of whether you're going to show up in college and do the work. I kind of follow up to that. Um, I work in a K-12 environment. And one of the things that troubles me greatly is that we have in this country about a 30% high school dropout rate. And the, you know, obviously in pockets it's much greater than that. And obviously with um, populations that are more at risk, it's even higher. And, you know, there are lots of politics and issues around the public policy that we've implemented in a K-12 environment that I think have impacted that um, in terms of why kids aren't showing up and why kids are dropping out. 
but I'm wondering about this whole undermatched phenomenon in relationship to those kids who are really at risk. So it's not like I'm deciding to go to Northwestern or Albion College, but like, can I even get out of the gate? And it kind of goes back to your comment about are these students that are becoming disengaged with education and not connecting to the dots about what does this mean for my life, disengaging at such an early time that then, you know, this sort of idea would then translate and how could we intervene with that? I know that's a big question. It is, yeah, it, it, it is a big question and uh, there are various ways in which you may think uh, the junior, senior year of high school is too late for a lot of folks, and, and a lot of folks are, are already in the process of dropping out at that point. Uh, there's, there's a lot of talk and interest in early intervention programs to get college on people's minds when they're in eighth grade or ninth grade. Uh, evidence is not real encouraging about our success so far in finding ways of doing that, and it, it's related partly to the complexity of the whole process because it would be really nice if you could tell people when their kids are 10 that this is what it's going to cost you if you get them to stick with it, but we can't. Uh, you know, we, we had, uh, I, I co-led with the person who's now uh, my wife, a uh, project on rethinking student aid, and uh, we had this idea that I really like that should start uh, putting money into savings accounts for kids when they're like six and just do it automatically based on their AGI, the family's AGI, and make the money available only for post-secondary education. So not a thing where you can change your mind and take it out, pay a 10% penalty and get a boat. Uh, it, it would be, uh, that, I think that, that actually could really change the way people think about this stuff if you did it on a serious scale. Uh, that would, however, require money. And uh, right now, that doesn't seem to be in the cards. Yes? Um, if you define undermatching in terms of uh, whether or not a student applies to a given school, uh, how has um, the changing uh, more efficient methods of applying to schools such as the common application, which is seen, um, which now has about like 450 pounds in the program that you say. Has that had any effect in maybe reducing uh, religion? Uh, one would think so. We don't have any evidence about the effect of that. You know, it's still true that the, I think it's still true that the, the modal number of applications a student makes is one, and they get in. Uh, that is, non-selective places dominate in terms just of sheer numbers. Uh, and in some ways, getting that up to three <laughs> may be like the thing to do. I think things that smooth the path, uh, you know, not having a quirky, eccentric uh, essay question <laughs> on your, uh, does, does Michigan have one? Uh, uh, help. What really seems likely to be effective is to have uh, uh, an automatic waiver on the cost of taking the SAT. Now, that's not an issue in Illinois because the ACT is required of everybody, but, but uh, uh, an, an automatic waiver of the application fee as well. That's actually more important. That it just, the way it is now, colleges say you send in this form, you report something on your income, and then we waive the fee. But if you could just give high school guidance counselors forms and say, we trust you, you know, give this form to, to anybody that you think it deserves it, and the fee is waived. I mean, that, you know, that just seems super simple. Uh, in, in Northwestern, automatically waives the fee if you're from a Chicago public school because 86% of Chicago public school students are classified as low income. But they could also be waiving the fee for everybody who applies from LA Unified or everybody who applies you know, from another city with a high low income population. Uh, I, can't, I can't believe that it's a big revenue source for Northwestern University. 
But I do think these simplifications are steps in the right direction. Brian, you wanted to raise a question. Um, I was just thinking about the causes. Um, I was struck by the fact that kind of the undermatch, while well, there was a gradient in family income or parental education, even among the top income quartile and those with, whose parents went to graduate school, with, I think I remember 30% or something, there's some huge number of uh, folks in that category who are still undermatching. Um, and I would have to think that. Uh, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. That kind of the reasons underlying the undermatch for, some, for that population may be very different than the reasons underlying for other populations. Um, and I'm just a, No, it, it would be, yeah, that would be interesting to think about. I, I in, in my years at Spencer, uh, looking at you know lots of research proposals and so on, one thing that strikes me is that uh, there's there's a very strong tendency not to study uh, questions like these for the upper income population. Or I think there are huge variations in how successful affluent school districts are with their students. And uh, even though what we really care about I hope, and I certainly care about, is the low income and disadvantaged populations. That doesn't mean you can't learn from studying other things. And I think questions like that could really illuminate the underlying phenomenon. Uh, so I now want to talk about assuming uh, that we've got a causal thing that's a significant fraction of what we're seeing by way of undermatch. Uh, what kinds of implications might we want to draw as people who are interested in public policy from, from these uh, facts. And, and uh, I have more questions than answers, really. Uh, so implications for action. Uh, this first isn't necessarily what you would call public policy. Uh, and these are, these are cases in which, you know, one way of putting it is you can treat the the, it's like the small country model in international uh, uh, economics. You can take the conditions in the world as given and independent of your actions. Uh, so partial equilibrium analysis is legitimate and all that stuff. Uh, if you have a niece or a nephew uh, who is facing this kind of dilemma and has a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, going to some crappy place, and is going to follow that person. Uh, just ask her if it's really, really serious. <laughs> uh, Russ Whitehurst, when, when we presented this thing at Brookings as part of our kickoff for the book, uh, pointed out that uh, he went, uh, his college choice was dictated by where his girlfriend went. And I, was, I, I like Russ, and I know Russ, uh, and I actually think he's a very good-looking guy. But I was tempted to say, uh, you know, Russ, if I were you, and I found a woman who wanted to spend time with me, I would definitely stick with her. <laughs> uh, um, but, but I think, you know, more generally, at the level of the individual student, making sure that that student, if it's somebody you know, and you know there's not some particular reason why this would be a mistake, to consider seriously extending their range of applications. It just seems like kind of a no-brainer that uh, I certainly, I, I get uh, all the time, as, as many of us do, I'm sure, get requests for advice on things like this. Does it really make a difference? Stuff like that. And yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, uh, now, for high schools and for school districts, uh, there are very difficult choices to make in this regard. Uh, you do have limited resources. Uh, you have, in, let's say, in the city of Chicago, except for these selective high schools, you're going to have relatively few students even on a fairly generous definition of selectivity, who could benefit by more intensive counseling at this stage. 
when we were working on the, the uh, uh, thinking about the MDRC pilot for this intervention in Chicago, and there, there are about 115,000 students in the Chicago public high schools, 400,000 students altogether, uh, and we tried to guess what was a reasonable ACT cutoff uh, for people who might be amenable to this kind of treatment. And to get anything like a reasonable number of people in a single high school, we had to keep lowering that thing from what, what we expected. Uh, half of the students in, in a typical Chicago high school are not going to graduate from high school. Uh, of the ones who do graduate, a lot of them are unlikely to do more than get a certificate of some kind from a community college. Does it make sense to devote your scarce resources to improving the placement of the more promising among the students in the school? That is not a trivial question. Uh, and we actually talked about that with, with Ron Huberman when he was the, the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. And uh, Ron's judgment, for what it's worth, uh, was the, the effect on how teachers and students would feel about a significantly larger fraction of students coming out of regular Chicago high schools into strong places and getting bachelor's degrees, even though the absolute number was a very small fraction would be great and that investing resources in that way would have a kind of halo effect on the, on the system that was worth spending money on. Now in fact Ron wasn't going to have to spend money on it because we were funding this thing but this thing's not worth anything unless ultimately people will spend money on it if it works and that's they're very difficult choices when you're involved in, a, in a, a high school with a lot of disadvantaged students and big equity choices involved. And the same kind of point goes for, for school districts. Uh, uh, and uh, obviously it would be good to improve the training and effectiveness of guidance counseling in general. Uh, is it a good use of resources to devote special attention to uh, information for, for uh, guidance counselors who will, say, specialize in students with better prospects? It's not clear you really have to do that. Some of what you need could actually be automated. Uh, you could, as Chicago does now, generate a match list for every student based on their records, and they give that to the guidance counselor. So there may be good, good ways to do this at relatively low cost. And certainly, Sarah and Caroline are working on very low-cost inter interventions. But there, there are policy dilemmas at these, at these levels. And then one of the questions I talked about with somebody uh, uh, during the day-to-day. -day, I had, a, by the way, I had a great time today. There were a lot of really wonderful folks here, graduate students, master students, uh, PhD students, even some of the faculty who are really <laughs> fun and rewarding to, to talk with. Uh, colleges, uh, colleges face a kind of double dilemma when they think about this. They all, in principle, want to enroll more well-qualified, low-income and low-income students and students of color and first-generation college students. In practice, one dilemma they face is they can't afford them. You know, they, they then either loan them up, which is a very scary thing to do. You know, I, I don't, you know, I'm not one of the people who thinks it's not smart to borrow to go to college. I mean, this is, a, this is an investment in yourself. It's a reasonable thing to do. But it's one thing to borrow $30,000 over four years, which is about what you can do with federal loans. It's another thing to borrow 80 or 90, and most of that money will be private loans, which will not have the kind of favorable terms that, and the deferments and income-based repayment and so on. Uh, 
that's a terrible choice in a lot of cases. And uh, uh, the other dilemma that, that uh, they face is if they want to avoid doing that, they may become need aware, right? And in fact, uh, about the time I left McAllister, we became need aware because we didn't think we could sustain being the college we wanted to be and guarantee that we would admit completely without regard to ability to pay. That's a very tough, tough dilemma. But another much more pragmatic point about the college piece of this is uh, uh, colleges usually go out and try to recruit students for themselves, for their own college. So, uh, or maybe you'll have a little group like Eight of the Best is uh, an example of that. And they will, they will, you know, take a tour to the city of Chicago and they will indeed hit some of these schools and they will try to isolate the, the small group of students whom they should talk with, try to get help at the school to do that, and so on. But the fact is that the probability that you're going to get students who are uh, a, going to decide to go to a selective school, and then B, go to yours. That, that's, a, that's a tough combination. This is an area where collective action by colleges just seems to make a lot of sense. Just a lot of sense. And, and if they have any kind of public spirit at all, collective action not to say, can we find the students who could get into McAllister? Because there's going to be very few in a, you know, or Williams in a, uh, in an urban school system, but can we raise the aspirations of students more generally? Can we invest some money in getting some students and some counselors on our campus, on campuses like ours? It doesn't have to be ours, but to make this world less foreign and less strange. Uh, can we find representatives among our alumni body with whom uh, these students are more likely to identify, and can we do that in some collective way so we can do it? And, you know, that just, it just seems like such a waste of money to try to do this one place at a time. So, so it's an obvious area for some kind of cooperation. I also think it would be super easy to get foundations to fund this. Uh, not the Spencer Foundation, but other <laughs> foundations. Uh, national implications. So, Stepping out of the microeconomic world into uh, thinking about system level effects. Uh, it seems to me if you think about this from an equity point of view, uh, it's, it just seems to me to be, uh, on any plausible view of fairness, uh, that gap in the undermatch rate just seems like something to try to address. Uh, you know, intuitively it seems extremely unfair. Here you have somebody who has had the level of achievement in high school and put up the scores that are needed to actually qualify for this kind of experience and to the degree that the choice not to do it is something that we can influence, that we can, you know, through better information and, and through making it cheaper uh, that we can do something about. Uh, it's really hard to see an equity case for not doing it. And I think if you think about then the policy implications of trying to address that, uh, there may be many and I, I would love, and I'll stop after I've said these two things to, to get your reactions to that. Uh, uh, one, one policy implication is for whatever resources you have, you really should try to target them on people who will benefit from them uh, in the sense that it will influence their choices. Uh, and, and to do that means being willing to introduce one way or another net price differentials between people who have more ability to pay and less ability to pay. You know, there, there is a fair amount of evidence and there's a little bit of it in our book that uh, keeping the price down for, for higher income people, top part of the income distribution, 
certainly makes them feel good, but it doesn't seem to influence very much their choice about whether to go to college uh, or their likelihood of graduating. Uh, but for people lower down in the income distribution, improving their financial opportunities seems to have uh, effects on their behavior. So a concrete policy implication is when states use limited resources to keep the tuition relatively low for all students, as high as it is, it's still relatively low, uh, rather than having somewhat higher tuition and somewhat more need-based or income-based, even better, student aid, uh, seems like, like a mistake. And the federal government in the last three years has actually increased by over two-thirds the amount of money going into the Pell Grant program. And that has been a significant buffer against the declines in, in state uh, financing of higher education that has been occurring. I also want to underscore that uh, the tax expenditure on, on college tuition which is partly uh, deduction and partly credit, more than doubled in one year. And one quarter of that money goes to people whose family incomes are between $100,000 and $180,000 a year. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting feature of our political economy that there is an intense debate about what can be done to manage the cost of Pell. And I've been a participant in that debate, been in that debate. As far as I know, absolutely no debate about what can be done to manage the cost of the tax credit. Uh, so there. Uh, uh, the other thing I think that actually is really important, and, and, and I, in other lives I've done quite a bit of work on this, and so have other people at Michigan, most, most notably Sue Donarski, uh, Making the system simpler, you know, there is a real problem that people sometimes just can't afford to go to the place that would be best for them. Uh, but there is also a real problem that people don't know what the actual price would be at the place that would be best for them. And we have designed a system that seems virtually, it's almost as if it were intended to keep that information secret, uh, which I don't actually think is the case. but. Uh, you know, Sue's work shows that when you, this is mostly about whether or not you go to college, not, not about college choice, but I think the same principles would extend to college choice. Uh, when you have something really simple and clear that lets you know the price is going to be low, it has uh, a significant effect on the probability that you will enroll. Uh, she did this, you know, as, as many of you will know, uh, looking at the Georgia Hope tax credit and other similar tax credits, and looking at uh, uh, when the Social Security uh, system ended the survivor benefit that meant college was cheaper for you if one of your parents had died uh, than it would be for if that, if that parent was in the Social Security system. That meant a sudden increase in what had been a very simple increase in price to people who had been receiving a very simple, well-understood benefit. And she did difference in differences analysis and found uh, significant effects from, from these changes. So uh, Sue has pushed for getting the FAFSA, which is now 108 questions or something, onto the back of a postcard. Mm -hmm. uh, and in our rethinking student aid thing, we recommended the somewhat simpler step of abandoning the FAFSA altogether and just having treasury uh, base Pell Grants on, on AGI. Uh, and, and we've made progress. There, there's been actually a lot of progress, particularly the tax people, the IRS is talking with the, uh, uh, and cooperating with the, the, the Department of Education people. Uh, so on the fairness side, I, let me see if people would want to make any contributions or ask any questions about, about that side of things. Maybe there are other things we should be doing as well as pricing aid and information. Oh, so I just so the information problem strikes me here that I was being 
really, really hard at that part of the day. So those of us who are in the business actually know about the, the whole range of schools that we have thought at, thought about sending our kids to, have sent our kids to, et cetera. And that's an enormous amount of information that we actually accept, right? As sort of, oh, everybody knows that. And in fact, yeah. almost nobody knows that. Right. And so the question, ask the question of a thousand high school seniors or juniors today. What's the best school you could get into? Or even ask the question, rank the following 50 schools. Um, and a very large number of people will have, I think, no idea um, you know, about match, undermatch, whatever it is we're talking about. And so I'm just trying to, just trying to imagine getting sort of systematic, reliable, well-believed information that would allow a kid who read your paper, read the book, right, to have some notion, what's the best school I can get into? How do I, how do I, find, how do I know, in fact, what's the best school? What's the not so best school? Well, all that kid has to do is write a, a one-page letter to, to Bill Bowen that demonstrates that he actually read the book, and Bill will get him into Princeton. Well, that's, <laughs> so, once again, you and I know you. <laughs> No, I understand. Uh, I think one important thing, and, and this is a very important thing, is not to be too ambitious about this. Uh, there is a tendency to uh, think that that the key thing in the undermatch problem is getting people into Northwestern. I keep going to that example, or getting people, uh, out-of-state people into Michigan, or you know, maybe in-state people these days into Michigan. Uh, but in fact, you can be a lot less ambitious and still make a real difference. And I think in a lot of cases, uh, at least for most people, if you simply gave them guidance on public options in your state, you know, and you didn't, I mean, the, the information overload thing is, is a real problem if you push very far. But that much, that's a fairly short list usually. You can have categories in that list. And I think, I think that kind of information is more feasible to think about. Uh, and the other thing is information about how the system works. That is, the peculiarity that you're actually not going to find out the price until next April. Uh, but you don't have to decide until after that. With these counselors that have been working with Chicago Public Schools who have come in and talked to us about what their work is, these are amazing young people uh, who themselves solved this conundrum and came from backgrounds similar to the ones that they're, or the students they're working with. And man, you hear about, you know, every day for a week I was on the phone with this, you know, with this kid or he was in my office every day during that season and I, to just understand what his choices were and how to make it work. We can't do that generally. I recognize that. Uh, but, and, and it is a really, really hard problem. But if you could simplify some of those choices down for most students, I think you might be able to get somewhere. Uh, but, and of course, it's not only information. It's, it's information with all kinds of emotional weight attached to it, which makes it even worse. Yeah. One more question, maybe someone uh, can pause. Oh, yeah. Or are we done? Well, we're uh, technically, this is, uh, yeah, so I think. Um, <laughs> wow, I was just getting started. <laughs> Sorry I kept wandering along. I was just having such a great time. Thank you all so much. <laughs>